Okay, so welcome back for our next lecture, running through these. Um, this one is about, well, it's my research domain, so I get to say whatever I like about it. Generally, it's about accessibility and blindness and that kind of stuff. Um, so, it's week five, as we've seen, we're not going to bother at all with the uh, questions. In the block quiz, but you'll see that these kind of questions are your self assessment questions, so you should be thinking about these. So, accessibility, as people seem to want to call it, I have an unconventional view on this, and I'm allowed. Um, you'll see that there's no real definition um, directly, there's lots of different kinds of definitions, and if you look in Appendix C, I think it is, Appendix C, yeah, Appendix C then you'll see that there's a number of accessibility definitions that are collected there. Okay? So, the point with this is that um, one definition, to some extent, as long as it's well found, is as good as any other. It's a, it's a similar part. Okay, so I think that this is more about effective experience. I think it's far more about um, the power to affect um, some kind of change or some kind of informational process in either you, in either the user or the uh, technology. Okay? So that's what I think it's more about, as opposed to straight accessibility. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a bit. So that's why we're calling it effective experience. But if you go into a standard UX company or a UX department, then you need to think they're going to be calling this accessibility, I'd imagine, not effective experience. You might want to disagree after this lecture and say no, you're wrong. Right. But you know, there we go. Yeah? Okay. Why is it just accessibility? Well, it's not just accessibility because it's generally far broader than disability. Accessibility is linked with disability. Okay? And I think accessibility and effective experience is far broader than just that. So I don't hold with this accessibility and disability is disability. I think it's about the ability to produce an effect. Okay? That regardless of how that ability does or does not manifest itself. And that includes lots of other things, okay? not just um, people with certain kinds of disabilities. Okay? So that's where I'm coming from. I don't think it's just that. <coughs> Uh, now, my work mainly focuses on visual disability and blindness, and so generally I've got a kind of a, you know, all my research papers are pretty much about that. There's some ageing papers in there, but they're all about, they're mostly about blindness. Okay, so you know where it's from. Okay, so I think, the reason why I think access, for, access is for everyone is just this, that this kind of different view on different kinds of data is important. Okay, so first of all, we can see that this person here is a cyclist, is a London cyclist, and they have these Boris bikes apparently in London, which is a terrible name for a bike. Why do Get me Boris. Anyway, um, named after our illustrious Boris Johnson. Um, however. Um, these bikes are there so that people can um, use them and uh, rent them and take them to where and take them to wherever they want to go and park them at another Boris bike stop, if you like, um, uh, for other people to use. However, actually understanding where those bikes are can be quite an access problem because if you're walking on the street, you've got to get your phone out, which could be in some ways dangerous. You've got to type in lots of information about where you are, or what bike you want, blah blah blah. And then it, it, after a period of time, gives you the answer. So what was designed using this? Actually, this is a um, live view gadget from um, Sony. Okay, Sony Ericsson. Um, these are very, very cheap, 25 quid. But they work on Android. They use Android, and they're tied to your mobile phone to give you a different view on the data. And really, accessibility is often about the freedom and the freedom to customise the flexibility to give you different views on data and different experiences of interaction. Okay? And this is a one good example. But here, what I would say that there's a thing called, as we we'll see, there's a, there's a certain uh, impairment, a situational impairment, which is about um, mobility. It's about being impaired by the environment around you, not just by your ability or disability. Okay? And I think this is a situational impairment that you have to pull out your phone and do all this messing around. It could be, on, it could be difficult to do, it could be dangerous to do. 
Here, we can just wear this little gadget on our arms, and it tells us where the next, um, where, the, where the three Boris bikes are and how to get there. Yeah. From our location, current location, where the best set are. Now, I've also been reading stuff. So, who's heard of makers? The makers community. Makers, no? What Some kind of. Huh? Some do the 3D printers? No, it's. No, no, not really. So makers are people who are, are like technology, but they make little devices for themselves based on commonplace, common, commonplace technology. So there's a big community of makers if you go and put that in on the web, anywhere else, probably. You've got your laptop, you know, hanging away there, getting, the, getting that away. We're out of So, so these makers, use exactly this kind of stuff, so there's various uh, makers whereby uh, a guy was saying that he used this information, this kind of technology such that he just had on his front door an arrow pointing left and an arrow pointing right based on where the three Boris bikes were, so he just knew which way to walk <laughs> as he went out, as he, as he left the door. Okay, I'm walking left to get to my Boris bike, I'm walking right, let's just do it on each way, that's it. Okay, so this kind of technology, these different views, so it's personalised, customised to the individual, often by the individual, is something that's quite interesting. Okay? okay. But it's more critical for people with a disability, say. Okay? So here, we've got a quote, it's uh, taken from an anonymous blind user, obviously they're not anonymous to me, but they are. Um, for me, computer systems are everything, they're my high fi my source of income, my supermarket, my telephone, they're my way in. They're my way into life, into communities. Okay, because obviously, you know, with certain kinds of disability can be very um, um, isolating, etc. Okay, difficult to get jobs, difficult to get work, difficult to interact with people, difficult to go out on social events. Okay. Now, there's not a single disabled user that I've met who, in any way, is um, is not full. Okay. They are all um, energetic, go-getting, non-depressed people. Okay, they're some of the happiest people you might know. Meet. They're really into doing this, doing their lives well. Okay, so we shouldn't be thinking, oh, poor disabled people, because they are. They're very up for uh, up for this stuff. But they, do. but generally, our technology is the problem. The technology that I've built in the past. The technology that I'm sure you guys will be building in the future, because it's not going to suddenly finish, is going to be the problem, not the person. Okay? So just, you just need to think that it's critical. Sometimes it's not critical. If I have to get my mobile phone out, tap around for my voice bike, fine, in some regard. If I have to, you know, if I don't have arrows on my front door telling me to go left or right, okay, whatever. But if I can't get access to supermarket shopping online, then that might be a problem, because otherwise I've got to go to the supermarket and be led around by a clerk, which isn't useful. Okay, it's not independent. Most people want their independence, as we all do. Yeah? Okay, so that's what you need to be thinking about. These extreme scenarios. And I just consider the things that we, we um, build for um, people with disabilities now, or with people with disabilities in mind, to be an Uber user case. Okay? These use cases are edge cases call them that in software engineering terms. Okay? So these edge cases are much more challenging than normal than, than standard mainstream users. They're much more interesting okay, to do these. They're much more interesting to think about. They'll take more creativity from you to build than to make. Okay? Okay. The other thing is that most of the time they become useful to if you like mainstream Society in the end. Okay? So we'll look at some, some of that could be the case. <coughs> so barriers. <coughs> barriers to effectual use. So um, many, many challenges for visual disability providing efficient and effective use. Okay. So has anybody heard of the, the common technology that visually disabled users use to uh, unlock their computers think all day? Anybody know? Screen, screen. screen reader. Excellent, yeah, screen reader. Um, if you've got um, a vision impairment such that um, you can't see certain, uh, su such that you're not um, uh, profoundly blind, then you might need screen magnification, okay, if you've got low vision, okay? So, the thing is that with screen readers, they, they can speak and they can work very fast, 
So, he, so conventional speed for a screen reader, how much? How many words per minute do we think? So it's way over 300. Some people can listen to 600 words a minute. You know, it sounds like a stream of noise to most people. Okay? So let's have a look at the screen reader being read, or at least being the best with, a couple of minutes. If this thing works. Oh my god. In the website, I'll press the insert key and the S6 key. Okay, this is and as I navigate around these headings, okay, it's telling me what those headings are. And that's, that's also telling me that the page has been well structured, it's been well laid out. If I want to, I hear the heading, if I want to go and visit that heading, I press the tab key to move to that heading. And and then it takes me straight directly to that to page. So in that sense, it, it's been very well laid out. Another way is, is how do I navigate around the site? How is someone with a visual impairment using the screen reader who doesn't have any site navigate around the site? Well, hyperlinks, of course, the links, the, the way that, that people do uh, click to links to get to different places is also important for a screen reader user. And then this time I'm going to use another hot, series of hot keys, and it's going to be the insert key in F7. Links to this Okay, and it's telling me that I'm now the links list box, but it's important that these links are being logically labelled, otherwise it might not make any sense. Talking of making sense, could anyone understand what it was saying just then? No. Well, you can if you're trying to listen to it, but this is a linked list box, okay, so that's that's the kind of component that it's going to be. Okay. That information there. I was raising a wish at Bridge College. We get some staff vacancies. Your journey through the college. So let's see how someone with a visual impairment would journey through the college. So I'm going to move to the button. I'm going to activate that link. And again, it's telling me that the page has three headings and a certain number of links. So uh, you can see it's, it's fairly straightforward using the screen reader to, to navigate the way around, around the site just by using um, a, a, a screen reader called yours or, or any other suitable screen reader. Okay, so you can see that you've got this sort of strangely bad disembodied voice talking to you from the screen reader and that therefore, how do you think that, for instance, the screen reader knows on that website, on that website, what things are, what links are, <coughs> what headings are, all that kind of stuff. Yes. Understands the HTML behind it. It understands the HTML behind it. It understands. It's actually reading. Uh, it's actually reading the document object model. But the thing that you need to think about for this is that all the thing, all those things are explicitly um, marked up properly, so they have a semantic meaning. You know, there's a meaning that's attached with each of these. They have semantics explicitly attached to them. So there's a meaning for each of the things. So therefore, we know that heading 1, heading 2, and heading 3 are in that order. Now, if you looked on the page, if heading 1 looked the same or different to heading 2, then visually, I'm saying that these two headings are the same thing. If I say there are three headings on the page, all headings 1, but they all look different, so I've annotated them as heading one, but they all look different, then, um, then visually I'm saying that these headings are different. But to a screen reader, they come across as being the same level. Now that can be difficult to orientate yourself in the hierarchy, which is the page, sections, subsections, and all that kind of stuff. If you don't have alt tags to images, then all you get is either the name of the image, which can be completely useless, or nothing. Get spoken. Yes. Um, I would just so you know that at that point where you paused it and asked us if we recognise what it said, yeah. and you said that it said something like link this box. Yeah. Um, is that kind of telling it what kind of uh, thing is appearing on the screen? Just in terms of it, kind of then I guess assumes some kind of knowledge, like um, knowledge, yeah. I guess because well, most most visually disabled users, this is because this is the tool the tool that they have to use then they're very knowledgeable about what the jargon is. So a link box, or a link list box, or a list box, or a combo box, it'll say a combo box. 
Well, if I said to most people, oh, just let them that combo box. They have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Okay, but you have to because that's what it says. And is yeah. that like just for, because okay, I guess in our situation in terms of computer science, yeah, you can kind of make a conversation, but is that something that uh, people who, let's say, are visually impaired that have no necessarily background knowledge need to get comfortable with, like the language that is used by the screen reader? Yeah, I mean, we have lots of, there's lots of training courses that go on to allow people to get comfortable with the language and to orientate themselves around um, the websites and that kind of thing. So Henshaw Society for Blind People over in Trafford, they do a lot of work which is educational. So when, if, if you are um, advantageously blind, like you go blind, then um, you, um, you often go on a training course for um, this, this kind of technology. Because okay? most people go blind advantageously, they go blind after they're born as opposed to congenitally blind, where they're born blind. And so that means that um, you've, got, um, you've got a set of people who are in an education system when they're young, which means they'll learn this stuff, and they'll learn how to read Braille. But very few people actually, there's only about 20% of blind people actually read Braille, there's not very much. Okay, or Moon, which is a different variant. And so you'll see in your notes, there's also, when we're talking about visual disability, some little piezoelectric keyboards that are actually Braille displays. Okay, so those are useful for Braille users. Now, these things are cheap, by the way. JAWS can be costing you over £2,000. A Peter Electric display, a reasonable one, might be costing you five. They used to cost 20 just for 80 characters of Braille. You know, and this, you know, this is just ridiculous prices for this kind of technology because it's, so consu because it's not consumer technology. The thing that makes a big difference to, disabled, to, to visually disabled users is the consumerisation of technology they can use, such as bizarrely iPads, where you can type right onto the screen. Yeah? So that kind of thing. Okay, so cognitive disability. There are many types of cognitive disability. It's a large spectrum. Okay? It's very difficult and it's the most under-researched disability for um, certainly user, user, human computer interaction. Very under-researched because it's very difficult, there's lots of different spectrum of people, okay? And it's very difficult to understand whether those people are actually getting a positive response from the kind of software and the systems that, you, that they're using, okay? So, with, with regard to cognitive disability um, or learning, uh, people with learning difficulties, it depends the language changes based on which country you're in and which is considered to be correct in that country. Um, then what you need to do is to understand that you probably don't know very much about this kind of disability. There is probably not very much research out there. So what you could do is make contact with um, 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 user groups. For, we, we have contact with a group called Change, which uh, does um, a spectrum of cognitive or cognitive disability people doing uh, learning difficulties in the UK. Um, and so, because we, we don't, there's not enough research for us to understand very much. Okay, so we need to just go and speak to people directly. Yeah. So that's what you need to think about as well. It's very difficult to do much with cognitive stuff. Yes. Uh, it touched upon something where uh, many things is under research on the disability side of it. Mm -hmm. But we make an assumption that current technology that is used for larger spectrum of people can be directly layered for those disabled people rather than creating totally new, which is new technologies that actually were effective and optimised for those disabilities. It's a combination because if you make systems that are open and flexible, as we'll see soon, then you are able to, and you, and you have this separation of concerns we were talking about, you decouple the program logic from the interface, then you can get the functionality of the program logic, but wrap an interface specifically for a certain user group if you, if you want to do that, or make it very much more customisable or flexible. Yeah? Adaptive systems and user modeling is something that is very you know, hot on this kind of work. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So, hearing. Um, hearing impairment is a very strong community. Okay? And there's a reason why they're a very strong community. It's because they were um, um, seen as being uh, educationally subnormal for a long period of time because they had difficulties in in um, vocalising, oftentimes, okay, because you can't hear, so therefore you have problems vocalising. So therefore, most most people who, who are uh, hearing impaired are able to speak the language of the country that they're in. They are able to understand the language of the country that they're in, but they may choose to only use sign language and sign language interpreters 
um, because this is their first language. Sign language is a language, and it's the first language of how uh, most hearing impaired users. Somebody who's hearing impaired in the UK will use um, British Sign Language, somebody who's hearing impaired in America will use American Sign Language, these are different sign languages. Okay, it's different languages. So what you need to think is that while it's okay that we're providing text descriptions and closed captions and that kind of thing on videos or commentaries there or help files, then that might not be the be appropriate for somebody who uses sign language or somebody who's uh, hearing impaired. Okay. Now I'm using hearing impaired in this context, but depending on the country and depending on the context, you might want to be, you might say deaf. Okay? Deaf people. We don't we never use terms like the blind, the deaf, because that groups a set of people. So it takes a person out of that interaction, out of that experience. So we talk about deaf people or people with uh, um, hearing impairment, or we talk about uh, visually disabled people. Yeah? Okay. Um, let's have a look at sign language one. If it works. Okay, so this is the kind of avatar that you can expect to be getting if you're seeing screen generated one, screen generated work. You can get these in off the shelf versions, so therefore you can just program them as you like. Finger spelling there. And they're often in American Sign Language. They're mostly not in British Sign Language. Um, the thing about the avatars are that they're very bad for body posture and they're very bad for face, um, facial expression. Sign language is mostly, well, sign language is probably what, 60 to 80% about the signs in the hands. It's, but it's also, without the signs, it's like uh, without facial expression and without body posture, then it's very difficult to understand what things are meaning okay? for a lot of, uh, lot of people who, sign, uh, who can read and speak sign language. Okay? So the problem with the avatars is that they're not that good right now. They do the signs okay, but they don't do the facial uh, glancing, they don't do the, um, the uh, and they don't do the body posture very well. Okay? So there's lots of work being done. And also sign recognition. You can sleep there, just a little bit. And you're awake. That's good. <laughs> um, okay, physical. So obviously we've got many types of input solutions for people with physical disabilities that are changed that are not um, things like mice. So you might have things which are simple binary switches, which work with say scanning keyboards, which you'll see an example of in your um, notes. Okay. These are software keyboards where there's a scanner that goes from left to right and up to down and you, you press the button when you want it to change orientation. So it's, it steps across, then you press the button when it gets to the point it goes up and down and that's how you can zero in on the key that you want. It obviously takes a long time to type, a long time to work a computer. Okay. There's, other aspects, there's other things like head operated mice, okay. uh, blink switches, <coughs> locked in syndrome, brain interfaces. Who went to yesterday's? Well, yeah. Who went to yesterday's uh, Turing lecture? If you did, ah, good, good job, good people. If you didn't, you should be thoroughly ashamed of yourself. Uh, I'm going to put the video up online. Obviously, it was about um, uh, cognitive neuroscience, and it's linked to computer science, which is very interesting. Okay, and so there was some discussion there on uh, brain interfaces. Yeah. Okay. Combinatorial. Now, in the past. I've been bad. Okay. Think now. Think now that uh, sort of Oprah, Ricky Lake, those ones where they're all beating each other up. Uh, thing. I'm confessing. Combinatorial disability is what I'm calling this, but we used to call it aging or senior seniors, or we used to call it you know age-related impairments. Okay. And the reality is that's crap. Because it's all about low-level combinatorial disability, and that can happen to anybody, anywhere. I don't know what aging is now. You know, people who are supposed to be uh, 50 are now are seniors. Are they? Jesus. <laughs> you know, people who are people who are people who are 70. I mean, my dad's 80, and he's using his iPad for everything. So where's the you know where's his combinatorial disability? He can use iPads no problem. 
Yeah. Um, he's even banging away on iOS. What do you need? Yeah. Just getting some coding done. So, you know, it's all load of crap. The reality is that uh, at any age, anywhere, we can have some kind of combinatorial disability. And to say it's only about aging is just disgusting. Okay? And I was as guilty as anybody of saying that, but because this is my lecture, and, uh, I get to say it, it's just uh, wrong. And you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't be using that. But you should realise that when people say aging, or age related, or seniors, then combinatorial is what they mean. Low level disabilities in combination. So you might not quite see that well, not quite hear that well, have a few jitters when you're typing, possibly. Of course, those things apply if you're on a train going somewhere, oftentimes crammed in like cattle uh, trying to type a message on your uh, iPhone. Yeah? Okay. So, barriers to effectual use. There's other barriers which we haven't covered, which also come into this, this kind of category of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of use, infectual use. So there's uh, this first one. What does that mean? Internationalisation. Internationalisation. IATM. Obviously, um, accessibility is A11Y. Okay? And this is just, 18 is just the number of characters between the I and the N, so we don't have to worry. Because okay, we're lazy. And uh, accessibility, there's 11 characters between the and the line, because we don't know. Yeah? Okay? So, language and understanding. I think this is a barrier to effectual use. Yeah? Um, big style. I think that um, this kind of um, language and understanding of, or can be seen as a barrier to effectual use. And so, therefore, we need to think about is it internationalised? Do we actually, is, can we actually change the fonts? Can we change the uh, glyphs, the characters, so that they are the right ones, okay, for people to understand. Um, literacy. So, literacy and illiteracy can, is mainly, can, can mainly be solved by education, um, but that's often difficult in certain locations, and so we've got things like, uh, uh, who, who's heard of Flash Kincaid? So, there's a Flash Kincaid scale of literacy, which you might want to use to see whether the people the people's level of literacy for which you are uh, writing for, for which the messages, the help, the, all the other kind of stuff that you're actually um, creating, whether that fits into the model of literacy that the people who are going to be using your system um, will be. So you might have, for instance, government resources. You're employed by government and you're there banging out uh, lots and lots of text on your resources for people who conventionally might not be well educated if they're maybe they're unemployed, they're trying to get job seekers allowance or benefits. They may not be, they may be very well educated or they may not. But the reality is that without knowing what audience you're targeting for, you're likely to use language which is familiar to you, but maybe not familiar to somebody else. Yeah? Um, often in academia we see ways that we see that we could use language um, which is kind of jargon language, or language which is um, um, academic, if you like, and it makes us feel good about ourselves because we know words that other people don't. But the reality is that that's not the way it should be. Yeah? So when you're building systems, building software, then what you need to think about is what about the literacy of the people who are going to be using this? Are you using terms, jargon, language that people can be familiar with? Is it in simplistic terms? Now, literacy also goes back to cognitive impairment and, co and learning difficulties, whereby you might want to use more simplified language for, say, prescription systems. So we're working on systems whereby, um, say, for instance, people with uh, lower literacy often don't go to medical appointments or don't take the drugs that they're prescribed appropriately, not because they don't want to, but because the language used on the, uh, the, the packaging and the language used is very medicalised. I mean, you know, half the time you don't know what it means anyway. You, know, you just have to take it on the phone. You know? So therefore, why is that? So what we do some work to try and simplify, um, simplify the language, and then uh, then send that language as a voice message. Okay. Yes. How about the misconception of literacy in regards to the Arabic language because it's written totally different, isn't it? Uh, not from left to right. That's right. But Arabic language I'm taking is internationalisation because it's not really about something whereby literacy. There's two versions of literacy. People think people who are literate aren't intelligent. No, it's just they haven't been taught to read or write. You know, mostly. 
So there's some, there is some people with learning difficulties who have got some lit literacy problems. But people who you might say have a literacy problem, it's not because they're particularly unintelligent. It might be, they might be very intelligent people. It might be though that they just they're not being taught the symbolism. The symbols not been taught how to do this. So and, and if they're from often low income, poor backgrounds, that's only going to be compounded. Yeah. Yes. Um, are there some easy ways that everyday developers can account for users with dyslexia? Um, no. Is the answer. There aren't. The only work that's being done actually um, on dyslexia at this point to try and account for that more easily is by um, some work by. Um, does anyone know Ricardo Beza Yates? Okay, so he's the head of the Natural Language Processing Information Retrieval at Yahoo. Um, and he's done a lot of work um, for you know, searches and that kind of stuff. And so he's working with somebody called Luzarello in Spain. And they, they do, they're looking at tools to be able to, to better understand whether the pages that we're looking at will be problematic for people with dyslexia. But it's early research work. So, and it's, it's kind of all over the place. So the answer is no at this point. I'd love to say yes. Do you know if dyslexia is an attention thing or is it a comprehension thing? Or is it very? It's, I don't know. I don't know. But it's, it, uh, it, it seems to me that it's not, that it's less likely to be an attention thing. It's more, I mean, I'm an academic, I can venture on from the way. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's far more likely to be a, a comprehension thing. Yeah. Um, basically, um, one person I know who's like, um, but the second stuff she mentioned something interesting recently, which I thought well, I didn't know in the class. But um, basically, so her kind of dyslexia is where basically she can't really read because things jump around. Yeah. And um, printing out on pink paper actually makes it like a lot easier to read things. Or if you just place like a pink, like um, you know those see-through pages. Yeah. Or yeah, if you place it on top of a white sheet of paper, you can instantly read things. And so does that work with uh, computer screens? Can she put a, a, a thing on a computer screen? Um, or can we put a thing in the background? She, she didn't mention that, but uh, it's just it's quite interesting because I didn't know that the colour of the paper makes a difference. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of variants, and that's the, that's the point with all of this stuff, there's lots of variants. And so the thing that's, that's key for all of this is flexibility in the, interfa in the interface. Customisation customize and flexibility, because you as an individual might want certain things to occur which which others which which might be detrimental to others. That's the problem we have in say the user resident working group which is which we're working on some um, on the new specification of standards for uh, option browsers and stuff like that. And so um, it's very difficult because in some cases things that we're saying as a success criteria to conform to in one part of the guidelines might very well have been have a negative effect on people with other kinds of uh, disability um, or situations or abilities um, in another part of the guidelines. So I personally think making things as flexible and as customizable as possible allows the individual the user we start off from a very coarse granularity, but then we allow the user to customize based on what they need. And you often find that people who need it the most are most able to do the customization because they need they've got no choice, just like visually disabled users using computers. They've got no choice, so they're excellent. Right, I was, I was thinking like open data will save the world, but like that falls down with literacy problems. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, but but openness to the interactions and the interfaces mean that we can plug in some kind of novel um, interactive algorithms which we know them once we can test them in a specific um, in a, for a specific user interface which actually does that translation once we know a bit more about it and once we can get people to personalise it. So while you're right now, who knows? But in the future, if it's closed, we're screwed. But if it's open, then there's some chance, I think. Developing regions. So the thing about developing regions that we might see is that there's barriers to effective use because of uh, energy supply, network supply, um, cost, okay, uh, literacy again. Now, you'll see there's work in, by IBM uh, India looking at vocal or spoken web, it's called, spoken web. Okay? So that's quite interesting work, which is uh, from developing regions. There's other aspects for, that uh, are, um, are, are issues in developing regions with regard to the kind of the kind of the kind and the quality of, say, the devices that they that people in developing regions own and have. So, for instance, uh, mobile phones are obviously the, the primary uh, computational compute resource, 
in most developing regions. And you'll find that in, but you'll find that some nice cross pollination as well. For instance, um, and we'll get to this. There's some work whereby um, phone to phone money transfers in Africa all done all the time. You know, no problem. It's only now that they're t they are teaching our technology, they're teaching us, so we can do phone to phone transfers. Okay? Barclays have just introduced it. Okay? But it's been going on for ages in Africa because that's the only way. They have a problem, they get around it. Okay? So we can learn something, but we can also give something back. Yeah? Okay. And low income. Low income is a huge issue everywhere, and it gets even <coughs> bigger in these times of economic uh, uh, crisis. Okay? So, well, crisis. Anyway, it seems to be the norm now, less of a crisis in now, economic normality. But, um, device independence is key here, um, and might be in any way, um, because we'll need to deliver compute resources on lots of different things, such as TVs like Raspberry Pi, we've heard of Raspberry Pi, have we? Okay, Raspberry Pi, a little tiny $25 computer we can plug into the back of the TV. Um, and also things like Xbox, Xboxes, Playstations, and all these other kind of general purpose customer kind of compute resources, which we need to then utilise. Because if we can utilise them, we can give people who are in the lower, in, uh, rather lower income, say, we can give them better educational resources, we can give them better access to online facilities, okay, which they may be excluded from at the moment, especially in the UK with, say, libraries shutting down and the reduction of open cluster computer systems, okay, that you might normally get in libraries. If there's no libraries, where are you going to go? Okay, to access this stuff. Nowhere. Yeah? Okay, of course you can also, you can also come back to um, Ted Nelson's famous quote. What was Ted Nelson's famous quote? Well, a good part of it is, authority is malign. Okay, so that suggests to me that maybe people want to close down these libraries and people want to keep a lot of people in the low income because then there's a, a nice... Uh, bunch of people all work for very low salaries and uh, very uh, malleable. Yeah? There's a possibility. If you're into the cons conspiracy theory, uh, it's a bit like uh, Ted Nelson. Anyway, so it's a loop. So I think it's a loop because I think we, we learn stuff and we give stuff. Okay? People in, development, people in different situations learn stuff from us. Um, people, we learn stuff from them. Okay, so here we've got some stuff. Device independence. So, device independence is mainly all about this idea of multiple different devices to be, to take so that we can take advantage of the data and the uh, functionality in lots of different ways. Okay, that's something that's been key for a long time, but it was first thought about back in the 70s and 80s for people with disabilities. Okay, lots of work by Dodds at Nottingham University of Nottingham on this kind of stuff, especially with mobility and blind mobility. Okay, um, mobile browsing. So mobile browsing, there's lots of stuff. For instance, the zooming browsers that you're using on your, uh, well, at first it was the Nokia S2 phones, Nokia S2 browsers, and, the, um, and now on your uh, iPhones and whatever. Zooming browsers are all about screen magnification, magnification and lots of technology went in, that went into those comes directly from visual disability. Okay, magnification. Yeah? Um, Real-world mobility technology. So most of the real-world personal, personal mobility systems occurred with, for people with disabilities. We used to uh, dress people up in large backpacks full of uh, pretty much uh, a massive battery and a tiny little compute resource and say, oh, now we can use differential GPS and go around and, uh, and sort of orientate yourself. Okay? So differential GPS was used a long, long time ago. Okay? long time ago for, visual, for people with disability. Now it's used on every mobile phone. Um, mobile phone for cash transfer, we've done that. Pringles Wi-Fi, so we've all heard of Pringles Wi-Fi. Have we all heard of Pringles Wi-Fi? No? Okay, so Pringles Wi-Fi, you'll see this version is an is a American or UK kind of job. But actually, um, it was used to distribute a single source of Wi-Fi around African villages 10 years ago. Okay, so it means you've got very good directional Wi-Fi in these uh, Pringles tubes, so therefore you can really focus your Wi-Fi at one point, which means you can split the signal better, which means you can distribute it to different compounds and hooks within uh, villages, okay, within a village. So you need one point of Wi-Fi, but you can direct that to way more than 100 metres with these directional Pringle cans. Yeah? 
Now, I'm not sure whether they were originally Freebook cans, because you get a nice long can there. I think originally they were sort of some long beer kind of jobs, but you know, Freebook cans do just as well. And the thing I always talk about, which you've already known, is the mobile phone torch. Okay? So we all know Nokia went to Africa, ethnographers, uh, anthropologists, and saw people using uh, the front of the mobile screen as a torch. So that's why now you can buy a mobile, a Nokia mobile with a torch built into it, and you can get flashlight on all these screens because that's what people were using. Okay, we're not having coffee, obviously, because we're pumping along. Okay, so this is a quick history, which is obviously very quick because I'm going to tell you it in three points. Okay. So, in the beginning of this kind of access technology for computer science, for computers in general, we had things which were all about text and the keyboard. And they were pretty easy for most people because it was quite simplistic systems. Text, easy. It's only one focus of attention because the text just bits out. Uh, it's all serial, easy to do. Um, and there was very little problem with that for visually disabled users, for users with lots of with, with uh, physical disabilities, which could very easy to use the to use keyboards, not keyboards, um, keyboard emulators, that kind of thing, this kind of work. Okay. But then GUIs came along. GUIs the same units of us all, but not uh, not quite all of us. Okay? So GUIs came along and this created a problem because how then do you understand what is in focus and what isn't? How can you get the information from it when the information isn't presented seriously? It's all in parallel. Anything you could be directing your attention to anything. And so the way we, we used to do it, old schooly, is we used to use a thing called screen scraping. So what we would do is look at a screen, and then we go, we pass it, pause it, pixel by pixel, top left to bottom right, to create some kind of model off screen. Okay, some kind of model of what of what was on the screen, so we could then see whether something was characters, and we could understand it was optical character. We could we could understand that this was a character, and we could speak it. Okay, as we pause the lines. Yeah? That's, our, that's the way we used to do it. And this was called screen scraping. That used to be the solution. But it didn't have any richness about it. We couldn't understand whether this bit of text was part of a window A or window B. It was difficult to get the image boundaries. Okay? We couldn't understand, because we had no access to the underlying um, machinery, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't understand what any of the actual what any of the information referred to. We just had to do that by some kind of heuristics such that we could see whether it was close together. It's kind of in a list. It might be, it might be right. Say if we write 80% of the time, 20% of the time we're wrong. Has anybody used speech to text? So when, at what point do you get frustrated if it's getting it wrong? It's 99 point something percent accurate at the moment and it still frustrates me. So if it gets 20% of everything you say wrong, it's frustrating. So if you can't, if, if the screen recognition systems from screen scraping get 20% of everything wrong, it's super frustrating. Yeah? So that's the, that's the kind of magnitude. It sound, doesn't sound much. We get 80% right. Oh, but when you're using it every minute of every day, oh God, that's a lot of errors. Yeah, big error rate. Okay, and now we've got this other thing called the off-screen model. So this replaces screen scraping. And it's a bit like creation of a document object model. Okay? So you know the document object model in web pages, where we actually create an a model of, of the HTML. Okay? So this is the same. We create a model of, um, of the um, systems that are working, and the only way we can create this off-screen model is by having access to, conventionally, to have an access to the guts of the operating system so we can see what it's doing. And that, that access is provided by things called access bridges, normally. Okay? Um, and this access is now common through pretty much most systems. So there's accessibility on pretty much all operating systems now. Um, so that's where we can get, get access to, say, what the title of a particular window is that's been selected, that's in focus. Okay? We can do that kind of thing. The off-screen model is actually something that's normally created as part of the assistive technology, it's called. So, 80, the assistive technology, is the thing that's the additional bit, the openness part, so we've got some flexibility and openness. This means that we can then communicate between conventional software that we've all created, and we've got some accessibility stuff that's created specifically for people who've got a disability zone. Okay? 
Does that make sense? Does that linkage make sense? Okay. Um, oh yeah, I've told you that. Dot given to object model. You see, I don't have my own slides. Okay, so um, here we've got um, an example, and it's very simple. I mean, because this is not rocket science. This is just a matter of getting the technology there. It's not. It's not something. It's not you know. It's not quantum physics. We're not you know talking rubbish. Uh, so we've got uh, um, Microsoft um, Active Accessibility MSAA with UI automation, user interface automation, um, and you can see that here we've got this conceptual model. So here we've got the accessibility tools. Okay. So these accessibility tools are things like the dual screen reader that we saw previously. Okay. Various zoom text, zoom screen magnifiers, these kind of things. And they link in, here's the code boundary, and they link in to the applications and the interface which automatically have MSAA provided. So all you're doing is making this connection between the two. And it's a bit like, kind of, okay, who's done, what's it called now? ActiveX, OLE, programming? ActiveX, do we know that? You know the stuff from Microsoft? Uh, so it's a bit like that. So what you're doing is you're saying, you're, you're saying um, I've got direct computational access to, say, Excel or whatever it might be, and I'm going to put it in my, on my application and use it. It's kind of similar to this MSAA system. Okay? You can make queries of what's going on in that MSAA system. MSAA system okay? Now, the stuff that every, the, there's accessibility bridges for everything. The one that's the most prevalent at the moment, where most of the work's going on, is this I Accessibility 2. So that's kind of a departure. Um, it, it, so MSA, some of the MSAA is going into there. Some of the UI automation is going into there. It's a departure from normal, normal Microsoft uh, stuff because it's open source. And a lot of IBM stuff's going in there. Okay? So that's going to be the new standard. It's for Linux as well. Okay. And we also have, to finish off, this nice technical accessibility issues with... Um, Things that are runtime, runtime interpreted to some way, such as Java, okay? where you've got a Java virtual mas machine layered on top of the operating system, which is, might, might also be a problem. So what Java do is they just have this, called, this bridge that goes between the two. So we've got a bridge which is for the native DLL, dynamic library, whatever you want to call it, okay? and then we've got the Java bridge class. It's quite, quite straightforward. So all we do is make queries via this Java bridge because it comes through from the native DLL that's actually running on the operating system. Obviously, even if it's interpreted, it's got to have a native component. Yeah? So even if it's interpreted, it's got to have that native component. So Java has the native component for all of its systems that it runs on. Yeah? Okay. So, um, so all I want to, you to look at here is Ajax and ARIA. So the problems that we might gain with some of this very, very decoupled separation of concerns. We've got quite a, quite a separation of concern when it, when it comes to MSAA or these kind of interface, uh, sorry, operating system level accessibility. We've got another layer of complexity when it comes to this kind of um, interpreted layer of, layer of accessibility, such as Java. Okay. Well, then we've got another layer when it comes to something that's decoupled off of the system, such as Ajax. Okay. So who knows about Ajax? Who knows what it is? Asynchronous. Java script. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. So originally, so it's famous because uh, Jesse James Garrett, uh, 2005, he's a UX evangelist actually, and so he he was uh, he, he first coined the the phrase Ajax, but work was underway long before that uh, with evangelists at Network, uh, not sure, Netscape and Greg, Old Greg Aldridge. Okay, but they just didn't turn, come up with the term. So we also have a solution to that which is called ARIA, which is uh, now Way ARIA, which, so ARIA is Accessible Rich Internet Applications. So that's Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And Way is the Web Accessibility Initiative, which is part of the W3C. So their, their solution is a more decoupled solution. Okay? Um, Aaron Leventhal, he's from IBM Mozilla, well, he's gone from Mozilla as well, uh, in 2003. So, this kind of solution was first suggested um, quite a long time ago, and it's still not quite there. We're still working on my area, so it's only taken us about uh, 10 years ish, 8 years. 
Yeah. So we're still not there for this very highly decoupled solution. Yeah? Because it's difficult to understand when updates are occurring in heterogeneous data. So that's the problem we've got. So the further you get away from the operating system level, the more difficult it is to implement consistent accessibility hooks and everything. Okay? That's going to be that's the problem we're up to at the moment. Okay, with that, we're going to meet next week at the same time. Um, remember that in two weeks we're going to the uh, gallery, Manchester City Art Gallery. Uh, make sure that everybody who should be going goes due to the fact that we're paying uh, 150 quid for you. So anybody who doesn't go is going to be killed. Okay.